All right, so the story I want to tell is kind of a unique story for a lot of reasons, but it begins with uh, this trial that I had. I had a client who had been uh, charged with first-degree murder. Actually, he's charged with two first-degree murders, two separate instances. And uh, it's one of those bad nights we were talking yeah, about earlier. Yeah, that's a bad night. <laughs> it's a bad night for sure. We can have some humor about it. I have no problem with that. Yeah, um, now you can have humor, tw- you know. Of course. 19 of course. years later, you can have humor when he's getting out. Right. So um, what's unique about this case is I think the crime occurred sometime in uh, maybe the year 2000, but it came up for trial in October of 2001. And um, this, of course, was one month after 9-11. And, you know, to other lawyers that are out there, or David, you know, I know you were probably in diapers at the time. Uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, Ali, I don't even, you know. But uh, some people, you know, but, but the idea of having a jury trial in this environment, if people remember, you know, the, it was this very scary time in the United States. There was, uh, people were pissed off and angry. Yeah. They wanted to trust the government. A little afraid, maybe. And it was, it was just a completely yeah. different, you know, uh, time to try the case. Like, for example, right now, trying a case may be completely different because you may get, you know, there's so much adversity and discussion about, you know, criminal law, reform, justice, and police, blah, 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 blah. But this was the opposite of it. It was like almost a time that the, you know, there was like a urging of, of, of a need for the government to be, you know, forthright, honest, and protective in a way. I, I, that's how I felt anyway. No, Never. I also, Michael, not to cut you off, everyone wanted the government to be strong and, and, and to take care of business and, and out wrongdoers. Yep, that's right. That, right. There was something that was just, it did not, you know, I looked at the jury, they were no one was happy to be there. Yeah. You know, it was only a month afterwards. We still, you know, there's still the pl- you know, plausible idea that more may be coming. You know, that's people right. are still walking on eggshells. Nobody really knew. You know, first began the super security and stuff, getting into the bill, all that stuff. Yeah. So, um, so that was like the that was the environment of the jury selection and the jury that we had. Now, the uh, and I mean, where was this trial? Held? It was in Wayne County. That's an important point. It was in Wayne County Circuit Court in what is uh, now known as uh, the. Uh, it used to be called Frank Murphy Hall of Justice. Now it's yeah. the Wayne County Circuit Court Criminal Division, Recorders Court. Uh, Frank Murphy Hall of Justice. Anyways, it's over on uh, Saint Al- uh, Saint Alvin. Is that what the street is on? Saint Antoine. Saint Antoine and uh, Gratiot. Yeah, those are the streets yeah. across from Thirty Six District Court. In fact, back then we used to call the thing called the Gratiot uh, Shuffle. We'd run over to Thirty Six District Court, do some exams, run back and forth, and hand your arraignments in the afternoon. Mm. You know, grab lunch. Hopefully, the they'd be waiting for you, and you'd have to go back over to Thirty Six District Court and finish your exam. But it was. Uh, I didn't have a Fitbit at the time, but I certainly put in the <laughs> steps. I remember. It was physic- It was actually a physical element about it. There was, I, I have to say. Anyways, um, so I tried this case, and uh, interesting, the prosecutor at the time, who uh, is Mike Wagner, who was a uh, now a judge in 36th District Court. And interesting fact is that Mike Cox, mm-hmm. who became the uh, attorney, attorney general, general, was yeah. the head of the homicide unit of Wayne County of the t- at the time, anyway. So what it, what what happened in this trial was um, it was it was this is a funny fact for the lawyers. I I don't know, for a reason I don't I probably wouldn't do it now, but they just discuss reasonable doubt as being a very very high threshold. It doesn't have a numeric value, but it's somewhere between like ninety ninety three percent something like that of proof. Government's got to prove it. Defendant doesn't have to prove anything. It's a high number. It's not like fifty percent like preponderance. It's way up there, right? So. Um, the case was an identification case as it related to my client. And the witness who didn't hear this, the only witness relative to my client, said he was about 90% certain that it was my guy, okay? So, of course, just to kind of fast forward in the closing argument, Mike Wagner was arguing, see, even the defense counsel said 90% is beyond a reasonable doubt. And him and I still laugh about this when I run into him. Like, we both, it's something that's so crazy and bizarre. But uh, of the other things that happened in this case, which are kind of interesting, were um, the, uh, there was a third defendant who had taken a polygraph, and they agreed to dismiss him out of the case. But while the case was going on, he wasn't dismissed. He's still on the case. He wasn't being brought over with us, and we couldn't call him as a witness to the trial. That was one issue. Another issue was in the process of when my client and the co were brought over in the transport, unbeknownst to them, there was a 
person that was there that purportedly overheard a conversation being made by the co-defendant, not my client. And they called this witness who got in the stand and said, the co-defendant of Kamor's client said, blah, 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 guilty, guilty, guilty stuff. And he also said bad stuff about Kamor's client, guilty, guilty, guilty stuff. Now, I'm objecting because I can't cross-examine the defendant, the co-defendant sitting next to me. He's got a right to remain silent. So it's a confrontation issue that uh, went on at the time. But nevertheless, it involved... Um, but the story of the first degree murder was that this this house had been broken into, and uh, the, and and I think it was known by everybody that was involved that it was a drug house, and I want to come back to that in a second. And there was somebody that was taking care of the house, and the person that was the uh, owner of the house got chased down and shot in the back, trying to flee the house. The person that was in the house that was um, keeping the house was a witness and was beginning to try to identify. Of course, everyone was masked and whatever, so it was a very challenging case in that regard. Now, um, the time frame of this also is interesting, Ted, because I, uh, when, I, when I got the information of the news I wanted to discuss, I was reminded of a number of different things that are dra drastically different. Number one is, you know, the late 90s, early 2000s, you know, Detroit was witnessing 700 murders every year, something like that, 750, 650, 700, right? Do you remember that time frame? Yes. All yeah. right. This is the era yeah. of, and I, and I don't know, the, you know, the era of uh, the, you know, rap was at its, gangster rap was a thing. There was, like, the L.A. gangs. Biggie Smalls. The drive-by shootings, you know, it was playing out, like, these stories that of the things that were taken on the streets were become, becoming mm -hmm. art, you know, and, and whatnot. And, I, and I'm, not, I'm not judging, I'm just saying it was so prevalent at the time that it was uh, shocking and then became a kind of the norm. So it is that kind of context that this is taking place. And, I, and it's kind of interesting. 700 murders, I don't know where that stood nationally, but I, I think Detroit said like 300 per year, something like that. But there's something to be said about that, just to kind of draw a distinction of what's been going on. But, you know, I remember having cases of drive-by, you know, drive-bys or people, you it know. Was, it was bad in the 90s. It was bad in the it 90s so and early 2000s. Yeah, you know, of course, it was all driven by the war on drugs. Of course the, uh, it was. crack Issues which, Crack, you know, heroin, which the I mean, war on drugs, I would well. argue, produces violence and produces no, no results. But nevertheless, it was that time frame where these kind of things were taking place. And what it sounded like was it was these some people broke into this dope house trying to rob and steal the dope and the money and, uh, you know, didn't expect the fines or whatever. And they could. Anyways, so I try the case. These significant events take place in it. And the uh, judge uh, who sit on the case who... Uh, subsequently retired and does some mediation, came out after the case had been submitted to the jury. And he's a friendly guy. I don't know if I cared for his rulings during the case, but he was always trying to be friendly to the lawyers and said, I predict that Camorn's guy is going to walk, get not guilty, and the co-defendant's going to get murdered too. Sure enough, the jury came back with murder in the first degree for both defendants. The sentence for this kind of charge is life in prison. There's nothing you can do about it. We don't have the death penalty in Michigan, but so his other case, and, and only because of that, because that other case was equally weak in terms of identification and whatnot, um, we went and pled guilty to murder two, and they ran the case consecutive with the other case. Now, um, you know, so, so from a lawyer's perspective, and let me just explain this for a minute, I hope no, no one on this call ever ha goes through that or has to go through that or has gone through that because, uh, you know, it, it really, it, there's a lot of reactions as a lawyer, as a human being that have. Number one is, you know, there's this overwhelming, you know, guilt you carry with you that someone that you were, was relying on you to, you know, try to win a case, you know, didn't work out and they're now spending the rest of their life in prison. That's a challenging fact. It's not the kind of thing you can just walk away from that. You have to really examine yourself. And you really have to examine yourself if you're the type of person who can take that case, give it everything you can, be prepared to lose. You know, because that's a reality, and it's not for everybody. And um, I never had an issue with my client, by the way. My client, I can tell you a number of different times where I had interactions with him. He was he likes me, I, and in fact, I talked to him today, and I'll explain that a little bit more. He never questioned my uh, commitment to trying and doing all that I could. There was never a question. Um, and he was aware, obviously, as we, as a, and, I, and I made a record. In fact... Ten years after his conviction, I got a call from a federal uh, 
attorney who was representing him, and, and a federal judge had made a habeas corpus ruling that his confrontation rights had actually been violated on this uh, jailhouse snitch testifying. All right, so I moved on, and, I, and the only other point I want to make to the young lawyers or the old lawyers that care is that, uh, you know, this kind of result, as we all know, David, you've won cases, you've lost cases, Alan, you too. Judge Metry is a lawyer we all have. You know, questions your, you, it makes you question yourself. I get reversed once in a while, so I lose them too. I'm talking when you're a lawyer and you lost cases. That happened too. I know, I know. But you know, you uh, you know, you, you don't question yourself, but you, you want to, re, you know, you want to make sure you're doing the right thing. You know that you know, did I not pick the right profession? Maybe I should, you know. But whatever it is, you know, it's really it, it, from a lawyer's perspective, it challenges you, like all things in life. It's getting knocked down, and you got to get back up. You got to brush stuff off. You got to move on. And whatever it was that I did at that time to convince myself to move on became part of my DNA. It may have been a good thing in a way. It made me maybe a better lawyer at the time, whatever, you know, learn whatever. Not not in the grand scheme for my client, but I'm saying it, it was a moment in my life that I remember today and there was events that happened afterwards that still, you know, 21 years ago, you can't say you have the same intimate memory of some of these things from that, that long ago. Nevertheless, so I'm saying all this because the, it, the facts are the facts. He uh, was doing life in prison and... Uh, and uh, that would be after he finished his first 20 years on the murder, too. So on Monday this week, I got a call from uh, something that I didn't fully understand, but it was uh, the office of uh, Wayne County Prosecutor's Office. They have a funded, federally funded, maybe state-funded office that is called the Conviction Integrity Unit, which what they do is they are uh, investigating claims made by people who have been convicted by the very same office and they claim their innocence, they will investigate the veracity of the conviction. They are looking to see if the conviction has integrity. Now, this is a remarkable thing in my mind, and I'm going to stop talking a second and get some comments from the other lawyers and anyone that wants to jump in here. But it's remarkable because, uh, number one, you have to understand this is the same prosecutor's office that achieved the conviction. is now going back and vetting the conviction that their same office did. That, to me, is insane, in a way. I mean, as insane in the context of where we exist. I can't believe it works. In the criminal justice system. That's number one. Number two is uh, what I learned, and this is more of a personal response, is that uh, there was a number of fundamental inculpatory pieces of evidence that were never turned over that the lawyers that worked on the case, and, and, and I'm talking about, I spoke to the lawyers from the prosecutor's office that are in this unit. They worked on the case, they told me, for a year and a half. It, like, you don't get the combination of that. It's very rare do lawyers work on a case at all for a year and a half, especially a prosecutor. And they investigated, they had defense lawyers that were now prosecutors, they had appellate lawyers, they had retired homicide detectives, and they really, really tracked down and worked hard on the case. What they learned was that... Uh, there was a number of different bits of information that were not turned over to me. As I mentioned, this uh, witness, this third witness that passed the uh, original defendant, passed the polygraph, um, I should, you know, they agreed I should have been able to call that person as a witness. I was prevented from doing it. At no time did they ever point any blame on Mike Wagner. I, I want to be clear about that, the prosecutor. These things took place without his knowledge. But they found within the investigator's file all of these uh, notes that they tracked down that, that, that were not turned over and would have been inculpatory. So, um, at the end of the day, after all this investigating in this group, they had recommended to Kim Worthy that they uh, vacate the sentence, and they called me to tell me that she had gr she'd agreed and that uh, this murder conviction from 20 years ago was going to be uh, set aside the... Uh, Conviction set aside, his record for this conviction set aside as if it never happened. 